Welcome back to the Cross Board Interviews with Chris Brown. I'm your host. And today we are uh, pleased and honored to have uh, a, kind, a kind of a colleague, I would say, because a sort of a competitive colleague with uh, independent journalism, independent news reporting, independent podcast guys uh, on the show, Jeremy Appel. Jeremy is the, I want to get this right here because I had to write it down 12 times because if anyone's listened to me, you know that I've had surgery recently and this is a massively long line of things that he's done. Former reporter of the Medicine Hat, former education and justice reporter at Medicine Hat News, former reporter at The Sprawl here in Calgary, uh, the co-host of the Forgotten Corner podcast, the Big Shiny Takes Institute podcast, two different podcasts there, and Currently, and I'm going to get this wrong, I literally just said it twice and I've already get forgotten it, the Appel Orchard Substrack, C, Substack, Substack, C, I, I, I right. want to say Substrack, uh, reporter. Uh, Jeremy, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and a pleasure. Like I said, I'm going to fuck up and we just started in the first two minutes. Well, thank you for making me sound way more accomplished than I am in reality. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I mean, I just, um, it, the, the URL is Appel Orchard. Uh, I just call it the Orchard. Uh, but, you know, the spelling of my last name and the sort of play on words, you know, confuses a lot of people. And uh, yeah, that's kind of my bad, but can't change the URL now because that's, you know, where people go to read my stuff. Uh, before we get started, I'll, I'll just say, as I usually do at the end of these things, the link to that uh, sub stack is in the show notes. So click on it, go subscribe to his uh, uh, his orchard, I guess, if that's how you want to call it. And yes, step get, into my orchard. There you go. And learn some great new things and be as he's a great writer. Uh, Jeremy, I want to start off with this question for you. And this is a unique one. What does journalism mean to you? Ooh, that's a <laughs> loaded question. Yeah. Well, no, it's, I, I mean, right off the bat, I mean, that's a, that's a, you know, it is really like, I think, profound philosophical question. Um, to me, um, journalism um, looks at what's happening in the community, in the province, the country, the world, even and sort of uh, incorporates various perspectives on what's happening, but does so in a critical fashion, right? And I, I think there's this tendency among many journalists at um, legacy media outlets who I quite like and respect, and I you know, use the work, incorporate their work into my own, that and, and, you know, this is promoted by management, of course, and advertisers and all these things that you can't have any opinions, that you just need to go to one person, um, hear what they have to say, report that, go to another person, and then, you know, the reader can decide for themselves. But, I mean, journalists are always um, making evaluations on what facts to include, what perspectives to include, right? Like if you're writing about the climate crisis, I mean, I think now it's pretty much established that you you don't have to go out and interview, uh, you know, friends of science or, you know, whatever crackpot uh, science denialists that are out there, right? And so, you know, it, it, in that respect, I think that, um, and increasingly, uh, so with, you know, a lot of journalists, uh, some good, some bad on like Substack and elsewhere who are working independently, um, I think are feeling freer to um, be more um, personalized in their writing, right? To, to establish their own voice um, and um, not necessarily just speak through other people, although that is a, a valuable part of journalism, right? Because like, you know, I, if I'm writing about, um, I don't know, if, I, if I'm writing about hate groups in Canada, say, I'm not an expert in hate groups. So I'm going to go to uh, the Canada Anti-Hate Network and see, take in their expertise and then sort of uh, come up with sort of my own angle on it. Um, do you, so I have a lot of questions to digest out of that 
before we, but I want to do that in a few minutes here because I want to start with this. Where did your journalism career start? Because I've been trying to track that down. And I think, I think you were, you're an Ontario boy, right? Yes. I'm uh, born and raised in uh, the great city of Toronto. Uh, the, <laughs> the center of the, well, to be, to, in my defense, I'm actually from Thornhill. Just Ooh, north of Toronto. I, I'm from east of Toronto. So I, I get to say that. Oh, are you where? Where are you from? Are you from? I'm from like, I, well, uh, Clarington, so right beside the dirty schwa. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which right. I've so, just lost my like twelve listeners from Oshawa who <laughs> listen to this, so they have now left and gone off. Oh, so, but but you're also like a, a suburban mm-hmm. GTA guy. Um. So yeah, I was born and raised in Toronto. Um. I did my undergraduate degree at York University. I studied philosophy and political science. I also took a bunch of like English and history electives. Um, graduated from there, uh, went to uh, the University of Western Ontario, or I guess it's Western University now. Yeah. Um, and I did a one year master's degree in American studies. Really interesting stuff. Um, but uh, wasn't, you know, exactly the most um, employable degree. Um, you know, I would have either had to go on to do a PhD, which after doing my master's for one year, it was like, I don't want to do more of this. Like, I'll just take my degree. And and and, and so I, I figured I would uh, apply to J school. I had actually, because it's always, it was always in the back of my mind that I wanted to be a journalist and sort of um, be able to see for myself what's happening um, in the community, in the province, the world, et cetera, um, rather than just rely on uh, what people, you know, what you read in the newspaper or see on nightly news. Um, so was it always written journalism that you had an interest in or was it radio journalism or television journalism? It, it was always, uh, it was always the written word that, that I was drawn to. Um, Why do you think that is? I think like <laughs> I I always have some unease about like speaking into a camera or a microphone, which is I know uh, funny because um, I host, host two, shows. two podcasts and I'm on video with you right now. Um, and you know, with writing, you can actually sit down, formulate your thoughts in your head, put it onto uh, paper. I mean, figuratively, put it onto paper. Um, you know, or your word processor. And you can go back and change things if you don't like um, how something is worded specifically. Sometimes I drive myself crazy with that. Um, and um, so, so, so yeah, I was always so drawn what- towards print, which obviously is like the, um, if you're looking for a job in the media, Especially in Ontario. Uh, it, yeah, especially in Ontario. I mean, good luck. Um, so I went to journalism school at Humber College. Uh, funny bit of trivia. I did a summer internship 2015. I was like 24, pushing 25. Uh, my birthday is in late autumn. Um, at the Toronto Sun, of all places. Um oh. Which you wouldn't expect with uh, for your a guy background with, uh, and your, your oh. com- comments that you've put on Twitter. I would never have imagined that the Toronto Sun would have been Jeremy's uh, first internship choice if it was. <laughs> well, they were just hiring. It was a paid summer internship. Uh, my, probably my favorite instructor at Humber College was the crime reporter for the Sun for like 25 years. He eventually just left because he didn't appreciate the sort of far right drift it was going in. Uh, he was a bit, I mean, you know, the Toronto Sun's a union shop, which yep. is, uh, you know, quite um, uh, funny. In, in, in some ways, he was involved with the union there. And um, uh, anyways, he said he didn't put in a good word. He said he, but I thought he put in a good word for me and was trying to... Um, Uh, juice me up but uh yeah so I worked there for the summer and that was you know I learned um more 
in the newsroom of the Toronto Sun uh, than I did in school. No offense to Humber College, but there's really just something to be said of just throwing yourself, getting thrown in there. Um, I remember um, I like the first day they just sent me to some like uh, press conference. I don't even remember what it was about, but it was uh, it was uh, Josh Colley who was a city councillor. I don't know if he still is, um, but it was something to do with the TTC and they just threw me there. And I was like, all right, I guess I'm just going to this press conference and I'll observe and then go back to the office and report. And uh, obviously, and I still get this whenever I write for an outlet I haven't written for before, there's always this anxiety. Like what if I write something and it's just totally not what they're looking for? Obviously that's what editors are for. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, I learned a lot that summer. Um, it was the summer that uh, Stephen Harper uh, dropped the writ for, I believe it was the longest campaign in Canadian history, yeah. or at least one of. Um, and that was when uh, Justin Trudeau sort of uh, shot from third to first place. Um, and that's so, when yeah. I shot my political career in my foot in that election too, speaking of that. Did, did you did, did you run in that election? I ran in Northern Alberta as a liberal for, in 2015 in Peace River, Westlock. Anyone who's listened to the show before. Oh, knows wow. So, I'm so, that so. candidate who got screwed over by social media, the ghost of social media past for not deleting their social media before running in an election so we what what, what happened what what, what tweets um, were so uh, in 2009 I, I lost a partner to drunk driving and his mother refused to let me go to the funeral because she didn't believe that he was a homosexual dear god that would be the worst thing ever she was a very conservative family so i i said on twitter in a drunken stupor because after you lose someone like that you kind of hit the bottle hard and that's why i'm a recovering alcoholic i said uh basically uh, along the lines of you can you can google my name chris brown peace river westlock they will show up uh what if what, if, what happens if you find out your mother's a bitch basically and basically at that time, the conservatives were looking for anything to throw slander at any party. So they came out, they didn't know the backstory, the context, they threw it at me. Or and, they knew in deliberately obscure. Oh, exactly. But the, the, the saving grace on my part was I didn't have to resign the election. Uh, the day after uh, there was a candidate in White Rock, Surrey, if I'm not mistaken. It was September 10th when mine came out. And September 11th, a news report came out that a former tweet of the candidate, liberal candidate there said, it's okay for women to smoke weed while pregnant. And that took the story, that took me out of the news and that became the story. So I kind of sailed by on that one. So yeah, I, I remember well, that election quite well. Well, this actually, Arnold Viersen. Oh is yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny. And, and this is sort of a nice transition. So after journalism school, couldn't find a job in Toronto like I had hoped. Um, I was very depressed. I just was like, I know that this is what I want to do. Um, but I can't find a job. I keep applying and either I get interviews and they're like, no, sorry, you weren't, or, or just radio silence. So I was just like, all right, fuck it. I'm going to apply wherever across the country. I'm going to, you know, start in some small town if I have to and work my way up. Ended up getting a job uh, in White Court, which ah. is, uh, is how I know uh, Arnold Viersen. White Court uh, Star? Yes, the White Court Star, which is not owned by Tor Star, is owned by Post Media, yep. which <laughs> first two newspapers I worked at were Post Media papers, which I'm sure they um, are, uh, uh, regret. <laughs> yes. If, if they know who I am, which uh, I don't know. But, I know White uh, Court quite well. This is a I small to... fucking world, dude. Yeah. Um, no, it's, uh, and so I knew Viersen. I, you know, obviously he's lunatic um has some really but isn't that, like i you know and this is something i sort of have had to uh navigate as as a journalist is just to avoid being charmed by these like psychos who are like really nice to you but they're really nice to you for a reason right yeah. it's because they want you to think twice if 
you're reporting something that's going to make them look bad like oh well they're really nice to me and it, it works on a lot of people i think especially in small towns um well, especially and, in small towns, and I, I, I come from a small town newspaper back in Ontario, the Orno Weekly Times, that's where I got my chops for the the, the written word was all the politicians. So I, I covered Aaron O'Toole's very first by-election, 2011, when Bev Oda resigned and Aaron O'Toole won that by-election. I was the first reporter to talk to him when he announced he was running for the nomination. So I know him quite well. But the person I see today is not the person I speak to. And when you sit down with Aaron O'Toole one-on-one, -on -one, you get that personable, like you said, they try to charm you, but you see the real person afterwards. You're like, yeah. So I know exactly what you're talking about there. Uh, yeah. Well, but mine, <laughs> cause I had, uh, I'd seen Arnold Dirson's rap video. Have you seen that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. My so father I sent that to me after it happened. He said, how'd you lose to him? <laughs> <laughs> because uh, rural Alberta. But um, yeah, and I, when I, when I moved to White Court, so pick up my life in tr living in my parents' house in Thornhill and moved out to tiny town in Northern Alberta. Remember the first thing I noticed when I moved into my apartment is a window in a building across the street from me had a Confederate flag in their window. I'm like, whoa, I'm not in the GTA anymore. Um, though I'm sure you could, I mean, GTA is so big. I'm sure you could find that shit. Um, yeah, there, uh, but there are some hardcore conservatives in, in Toronto for some reason. Yeah, but I mean, that's beyond conservatism, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, as we both know, the conservatives like to uh, like to flirt a little with those sentiments, um, to put it mildly. Um, and the second thing I noticed was that my MP was the guy who did that rap video. And I was like, oh, this is, this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, but, you know, I mean, to Veerson's credit, I asked him tough questions and he answered them to the best of his ability. He didn't uh, get defensive or anything. Um, and anyways, was in white court six months, was super depressed. Uh, I had difficulty sleeping at night. I think it was probably because I was drinking too much coffee during the day in retrospect. But I would ha also have like nightmares about just being stuck in white court, like for the rest of my life. And, uh, and White Court is a good, is a nice community. It is a uh, interesting community. The only reason I say that is because I want to sit down with their mayor in the next few months. So I got. <laughs> oh, is their mayor um, uh, Tom Tom Picard? Is that his I name? think so. Unless he lost the last election, I haven't seen. No, him. I think he won. Uh, okay, then I, yeah, it's Tom. Because I I left before he was elected to council, but I when I saw he was running for council, I was like, oh, I hope he wins. He seems like a very decent guy um the only thing know, I, I find with white court is the smell of the pulp mill every time i drive into that community that's all i can smell for me what what i was the just the getting eaten alive at the uh what was it, rotary park there <laughs> like just so many mosquitoes but um so from White Court, you uh, is this when you make your transition to Medicine Hat or yes? You... So I'm looking for jobs. Um, I went home uh, during the summer and you know just hang out with my friends. Really missed home. I was like, okay, hey, like, uh, like the obviously I'm not going to find a job in Toronto at this point in my career, but I, I need to go somewhere that's more of a city than White Court because I'm like going insane. I was drinking a lot put on a lot of weight. Um, and anyways, this opportunity uh, came up in Medicine Hat. Um, I went, because the job was a six month contract. Um, so when I interviewed for it, I was like, I didn't, I, I wasn't really sure if I wanted to, you know, because I think there's an, also a natural inclination um, to, you know, be afraid of, uh, of change. Um, which I obviously had to get over to move to White Court. Um, but I, I just wasn't sure. But anyways, I, so I just, when I did the interview, I just didn't care. So I obviously just knocked it out of the park, right? Like the, the, of course. the, the managing editor at the time was like super impressed by me. Um, and so I got the job down there. So moved from 
I mean, not quite one end of Alberta to another, but, you know, from close enough, <laughs> a bit northwest to the far southeast. And um, yeah, it was so I was on the that's, six month. that's when you kind of in medicine hat, that's when you kind of become the a quote unquote political hot potato in 2019, because in 2019, you write an editorial mm-hmm. that doesn't just spark a uh, political outrage on the left or on the right. It gets people on the left galvanized that, Hey, there's an independent newspaper down in medicine hat uh, who's willing to speak out against uh, the government. And we want to sort of talk about it with the war room. Mm-hmm. Now, common misconception, the Medicine Hat News isn't independent. It's isn't actually it? owned by Glacier Media, which is owned by, uh, now that I don't work for the Medicine Hat, I can say uh, David Radler, who lives in Vancouver and is literally a convicted criminal. He's the guy who snitched on Conrad Black and got a lesser sentence and was able to spend a good chunk of it in Canada, where, you know, parole is more lenient. Um and uh, I, we're, I, we're, I thought they were independent. Sure, yeah, no, lo- lots of uh, lots of people assume that just because why? How else would I be able to? And my, of course, colleague and dear friend and uh, you know mentor uh, Scott Schmidt, uh, were able to you know just sound off the way we were able to, right? You would have you would assume that it's because yeah. we're an indie media outlet, but it wasn't. It's just I think it was the right combination. Because for me, what really attracted me to the Medicine Hat News and saw it very much as a step up was, I mean, first of all, Medicine Hat is very small, but it's a hell of a lot bigger than White Court. Um, it was a daily newspaper, and uh, but it was still a very small market yep. where, you know, they have their reporters also writing opinion. Like, that's just an expectation. So, you know, sometimes when I would get talking to you about something I tweeted or something, I'd just be like, all right, you know, I, that's fine. You don't want me to express opinions. Then I'll stop writing editorials. And it's like, no, 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 we, we want you to do that. It's like, well, all right. And, um, you know, so it, there was a bit of a, you know, cause I was quite outspoken on social media and, um, you know, I, I think I was able to do that because it was a small market that n- people weren't really paying attention to until they started to. And then I sort of had this leeway. I had, you know, an audience of my own that wasn't sp- tied to Medicine Hat, um, right? Because I mean, Medicine Hat um, is, uh, you know, historically a very conservative city. Um, you know, you see changes in that that are sort of microcosmic of the broader changes in the political culture of Alberta. You know, if you saw the the results of the last election in Medicine Hat, the uh, UCP Toady Mayor got destroyed. Uh, Tadley too, like huge, like the yeah, there. yeah. Like, he's really shocked. bitter about it as well. Is oh, I can imagine. Yeah, but um, yeah, he's not a great guy. Um, so I, I I was happy to see him eat shit um on election night, um, mm-hmm. because he's 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 just awful. He um. You know, he would always talk shit about the paper, including uh, to a class of school children, uh, told them that we're, we lie about him and we bully him, um, which we don't. I mean, we, or they don't. But anyways, um, so, so I, yeah, I, I, I was sort of. It, sorry, at what point in time do you think to yourself, OK, this 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 opinion piece has come out about the war room. The war room has responded to you. and. I now have this new following that is just my following. It's not the paper's following, it's my following. It's time to sort of move up in the world. Or is it, are you comfortable being in Medicine Hat? And then sort of Calgary comes a calling to you. How does that transition work? Because that's the interesting part that I want to know. Yeah, well, um, I guess for for starters with this op-ed, so in October, 2019 I went back to visit Toronto and I got I was really homesick um you know I was sort of getting bored of just being this uh reporter at the small uh town newspaper 
And when I got back, I was just like, hey, I need to move to Toronto. I need to start applying for communications jobs. But at the same time, Scott was starting to write these columns that were getting a lot of momentum. And he had sort of um, sort of opened the floodgates um, for me, I think, to be more daring in my writing and to, um, you know, because I had written stuff before that was critical of the government and whatnot, but I really pulled my punches. But Scott, I think, started the snowball effect. Um, and not just in the Medicine Hat newsroom, but I think elsewhere in, in newsrooms across the province. And I was just like, okay, you know what? I'm, I'm like mentally checked out. So I'm gonna write this, like this war room stuff is crazy. I remember telling a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine back in Toronto about this war room that the government's giving $30 million to like harass environmentalists and like write, um, you know, op-eds to newspapers. And he thought that was the craziest thing he's ever heard. So I, I was just like, okay, I'm, just going to write whatever I think. And, you know, I guess I didn't really think of what would happen as a result of it. It was just like, might as well. And so the editorial came, comes out on a Saturday. And I mean, it does decently on social media, like above average than most of the things I wrote, but it wasn't huge or anything. Um, and then Monday, I'd get into the office and I check my email before our morning meeting and I see this email from uh, Grady Simmons of the Canadian Energy Center uh, sent to me and my boss. Really uh, stupid move on their part. Um, not just going above my head, um, which I'm uh, uh, an error I'm quite grateful for. But um, I saw it and without like just took my immediate instinct I screenshot it went to Twitter and I was like bring it on more room and I uh sort of closed my Twitter and uh asked my my boss at the time hey did you see the email we got from the war room she's like no I haven't checked my email yet and I was like oh well uh <laughs> you should uh, <laughs> you should yeah and then I opened my Twitter and all of a sudden it's exploded in people um who I was quite familiar with who um you know like uh you know like Jason Markusoff and like um you know Jen Gerson um who I'm you know certainly not a fan of but they were talking about it and uh you know Matt Gurney uh stepped in to defend the war room um the bootlicker that he is um you know saying well I, I get angry uh letters from readers all the time it's like well are they the government <laughs> like, but <laughs> are they um, the people that were paying our taxes to do this stuff type of thing yeah hack us? yeah but it was just like it was really overwhelming uh, uh once my boss <laughs> checked her email and went on twitter she was just like whoa like the, the, the <laughs> And, uh, you know, the, the, it was sort of a, a, a thing that was like better to ask for forgiveness for permission. Like, it was just like, this is what I'm going to do. And my uh, following on Twitter, like, tripled that day. Like, I went from like 800 and something followers to like 3,200. Really overwhelming. Um, and yeah, just overnight, I became someone who people were interested in what they had to say. Um, and I, it was, um, it was, it was a trip, you know, and, uh, you know, I think I got a bit arrogant and, you know, I picked some Twitter fights, um, that I probably shouldn't have, um, but, uh, you know, spending too much time on that app, which I'm still, um, still suffering from, but, um, you know, um, going into the new year, I was like, all right, let's, let's see where this goes, right? The Medicine Hat News sort of gained this reputation as this, uh, you know, bastion for, uh, for truth and um, sticking up to the, 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 the powers that be in, 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 in ways that other news outlets weren't in the province. And I think that's why it resonated with a lot of people. Um, 
And so I, you know, I continued reporting, writing columns. With Did you them. become the de facto political editorialist? Because you think after that, because people now were looking at you to say, hey, this person has an opinion on politics, on the war room. Maybe he has opinions on other things. Or did you find that sometimes when you wrote other articles or rather other opinion pieces, editorials on other issues, some might go, well, it's not doing as good. So maybe I'll stick with my political opinions than the i'd say education opinions or justice opinions or even well well so so i i mean the thing is and and one thing i'll say about um the um pace of work at the medicine that news at the time was that it was like we were expected to produce an unreasonable amount of copy as people, I think in many newsrooms across the country experience, right? It was like bang out like three stories a day. Uh, I had two beats because of contractions in the newsroom and layoffs, uh, or, or actually in that case, it was that uh, one person left and upper management in Vancouver was just like, oh, well, you don't need to hire someone to replace them. You're, you're doing great. Um, and, um, so I didn't have as much time to write opinion as I did. I think it was Scott who became the sort of de facto columnist at the Medicine Hat News. Um, and I just continued doing reporting. I sort of found new and sort of creative, uh, ways to frame stories. Um, you know, sort of what I was alluding to earlier about, um, you know, reaching out to sources that you wouldn't necessarily see in other news outlets, uh, and certainly not like historically in the Medicine Hat News and sort of trying to um, place uh, local stories in a, in a broader like provincial context. Um, but then uh, COVID happened. And yeah, have you heard about it? Have you heard I, about I, this COVID I, thing? I, I've heard something about it. Maybe like started in a mail envelope to China. That's where it started from Canada. I don't know. Don't know all the details about it because it's so wishy-washy these days. Yeah, I mean, it's fine. Yeah, I mean, if you haven't heard of it by now, <laughs> exactly, you're doing great. So COVID um, hits in 2020 because literally... This happens in October, this opinion piece of 2019. So literally as COVID is going this up. This is December 2019. That, 2019, that. sorry. So literally China's getting hit by it. The world's not taking notice until basically March of 2020 when we go, oh crap, we have now a pandemic on our hands where the world is now going to be locked down. So what happens? Like, because you are, you're not medicine hat now. <laughs> Right. And so basically, you know, the first month I had to adjust to working at home, obviously, I think, you know, those early days of the pandemic, it's easy to forget, like, we all thought the world was going to end, you know, or I, I shouldn't say we, I thought the world was going to end, um, you know, Donald I Trump's was president. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was sleeping erratically. I was, uh, sh I mean, showing up is perhaps a misnomer, but I was late to work a bunch of times and it was just a whole mess. Um, I was, I had also um, in 2019 became more active with the union there. And we were uh, about to start, we were supposed to start contract negotiations in March, 2020, which, and I had gotten people involved with the union at work who had never taken an interest in it, just getting them fired up to like take on management and to like, uh, create better working conditions and that and that all um you know uh fell to the wayside and then uh in april 2020 uh i got laid off um you know i was the most recent it wasn't you know some people when that happened on twitter thought it was this big conspiracy to like shut me up um it wasn't it trust me if it was i would have been very vocal about that um, it was, I was the most recent person to have been hired. So I was the first to on the chopping block. And so I went on CERB, freelanced a bit, not as much as I would like to, because again, early days of the pandemic, like people are, Nobody was hiring. yeah. So I just sort of bummed around medicine. Hat. I remember running into someone from, uh, one of the other news outlets in the city and they're like, 
you're still here like what like i would have assumed you moved back to toronto i was like well i'm like i know it was a temporary layoff which ended up being permanent um but you know i could have been called back to medicine hat news whenever um but at that time i was like okay like uh you know i'm gonna use this opportunity to try and move because I, I by by this point i was like okay i need to stay in alberta for for the time being like i've you know um contributed to the discourse here i'm now like an established voice to some extent like you know i want to move to the big city you know calgary or edmonton um and anyways i was freelancing a bunch including for the sprawl which was an outlet i had discovered sort of around the time the whole war room thing. I mean probably earlier in the year with uh Taylor Lambert's piece about uh where he went to San Francisco to talk to people who knew Kenny when he was there and making uh homosexuals lives miserable um as, as well as women who uh wanted reproductive freedom um and so the spa was on my radar and uh you know sort of uh jeremy clausus was one of the people who i sort of you know i made a lot of friends on twitter I, and that's i think what um keeps me coming back to the <laughs> app i mean first of all because i i mean i took a month off in in november and it was it was great for like my peace of mind but um especially when you're uh promoting your own personal newsletter not great for growth no, very bad for growth actually so but anyways uh there's that but also i made a lot of uh close friends i mean when when i moved to calgary i already had like a group of friends right who i'd met online uh when i was still living in medicine hat and had come to calgary on union business i would meet with them in person and um you know it was uh it was really exciting and I Clausus was one of those people I had uh, sort of uh, connected with on Twitter and I started freelancing for him uh, as well as the you know the progress report Duncan Kinney um, which I've you know done some work but for both those outlets I've done a lot of work that I'm very proud of uh, also a new uh, left-wing opinion site I had uh, just started uh, like a month or two before the pandemic called Passage yeah. which I've uh, written quite a bit for and um, again things were slow I remember that summer it was it was almost like uh, that that those six months after journalism school where I just couldn't find a job like I was just really down in the dumps uh but then there was an ad for the sprawl um that was hiring a part-time city hall reporter and you know I I was like that could be me I mean I know the people who work at the sprawl we have a good relationship I've written for them a few times they like my work they know I'm easy to work with um I'm not like a pain to edit. Like I'm cool with people editing my 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 words. In fact, I I I, I know some reporters I've, who despise it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, me too. Me too. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of them are on Substack. But even on Substack, I make sure every all. I mean, there's one there's one piece where it was like a Q and A I did with someone, in that I just edited myself. I plugged into Otter and then condensed it and made sure everything flowed. Um, but I always make sure someone edits my work at um, Substack because I'm insecure as a writer. Uh, you know, I, whenever I write anything, I just assume it's an incoherent mess until people tell me otherwise. Um, and, you know, you have an editor who makes some changes and they're like, it's good to sort of, um, you know, so saves you from your worst impulses, but um, I digress. Uh, so, I, but I was like, I've never lived in Calgary. So, you know, say hall, I mean, I, from living in Medicine Hat, I, you know, I knew who, well, I mean, I knew Nenshi was when I lived in Ontario because he was like a superstar um, in, in terms of municipal politics in Canada. And, you know, I knew through, I, I knew Drew Farrell and Evan Woolley and like I'd heard of like Diane Colley Urquhart, who um, today is the only uh, Calgary City Councilor who's blocked me on Twitter. Um, I had the pleasure of chatting with her during the election. It was a great chat. Oh, she lost so bad. Um, and I, you know, kind of reveled in that but also dan mclean is you know well to the right of her so um 
can't win all of them there jeremy <laughs> yeah yeah well uh but um but yeah i mean i had the interview so you got with... to calgary you're working part-time as the city hall reporter you start making all these connections with the city hall are you were you happy at this time because you're sort of in a larger city it's not as big as the uh, toronto because let's be honest toronto as you said at the beginning of this interview is kind of the center of the universe when it comes to torontonians mind thinking because yeah. well a lot of people don't know this but actually um um the human race originated um on uh the shores of lake ontario in toronto yeah uh-huh. Fun fact. <laughs> there you go. It is jokes. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I got it. I was like, wow. I was like, okay. Uh, no. Um, so you but, must, be, you must be a little bit better now because, like you said, you're, you're, you're pandemic. You're kind of back in a larger urban center where you're not dealing with like 10,000 people because in a city of that small or a town that small, everyone knows everyone's issues and people know where you are. Well, well Mason had. Medicine Hat has like 65,000. Okay, yeah, sorry. Uh, so is, White Court is uh, 10,000 or maybe even less. But So um, you, you grow a little bit into the, the larger, like one point, however many people are in Calgary right now. Oh, of course, I, I, I forgot to mention uh, during the pandemic, I, of course, started two podcasts, uh, one with uh, Scott Schmidt, uh, who, you know, was my partner in crime at the Medicine Hat News. Um, and the other with uh, Big Shine Takes, a couple of friends from journalism school, where we had a group chat where we were always making fun of like Canadian pundits. We were like, we always joked about starting a podcast as, did, you know, me and Scott had always talked about it and then COVID happened and it's like, well, what are we waiting for? Um, but um, when I got to Calgary, there was uh, this, 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 this contrast between, you know, I was doing great personally. Um, but then the entire world is like <laughs> crumbling around us, right? And um, you know, it, it was a it was a pretty stark contrast. Um, you know, I, I I did a lot of work I'm proud of at um the sprawl. I I'm very grateful for Jeremy to give me the opportunity to move to the big city and cover city hall. Um, and also uh, to sort of let me uh, um, be inflammatory on social media, um, you know, um, without needing to play this game of cat and mouse I had with my previous boss. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was, uh, no, it was, that was a great year for me personally. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite. Be sure to hit that subscribe button today to be kept in the loop of all the great episodes that are coming up on the show. Also, click on the links in the show notes and follow our social media pages as well. And then Um, in 2021, the municipal election happens. And during the middle of the, kind of at the beginning, actually probably I'd say July or August, you might be able to clarify Jeremy, the editor-in-chief of The Sprawl, announces that in at the end of the municipal election, uh, there would be sort of a reduction in not service, but uh, publication, and they'd be going into more of a, instead of producing a shitload of content, just producing good content and reducing everything. Were you taken back? Did you know this was coming? No. Oh, yeah. I mean, he gave us a heads up uh, well before he announced it publicly. Um, I, you know, I, we, we had seen the writing on the wall. Like we knew our finances weren't in great shape. Um, that, um, you know, this expansion was premised on the assumption that our readership would grow and it didn't really. Now, you know, the I think there's a question of whether uh, sufficient uh, effort was put in to do that. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, I, at, uh, but at the end of the day, it was just Jeremy was, wasn't, um, wasn't comfortable in, in, in the role of a boss, right? I think he, he wanted to go back to how, how the sprawl in the old days was when he first started. And, um, you know, where it was essentially just him 
and freelancers. And, you know, he didn't have to worry about sustaining growth. Um, and, um, you know, all these numbers and metrics and, you know, I, I empathize with that. Like I, I wouldn't put myself in that position, but it, if I did make that mistake, then I, you know, I would do the same thing probably, um, you know, it's hard to say, but, um, but now yeah, I mean, you're back as an in, sort of an independent freelance writer from what I understand, because you've got Substack, you've got, you're, you're working with uh, Duncan Kinney again at Progress, uh, Press Progress or however you want to pronounce it. I apologize. The Progress Report. Progress uh, report. So, so people always make this mistake. I also write columns sometimes for Press Progress, but uh, those are entirely yeah. separate <laughs> entities. Um, uh, if Duncan says something you don't like, don't don't tweet at Press Progress. It's they have nothing to do with it. Um, but um, yeah, Press Progress is a national news outlet that is um, um, part of the Broadbent Institute. Um, you know, which was founded by former NDP leader Ed Broadbent. Um, and, you know, they do a lot of great reporting. I mean, it just came out, uh, I believe, New Shield or whatever that um, yeah. um, uh, the organization that basically is called. looks at the uh, credibility of news organizations across the world and uh, gives you a rating zero out of 100, if I'm not mistaken. And that organization did get 100%. And I did see that tweet because I saw that you retweeted and you or you commented on it about David Aiken. <laughs> right, because he's always, uh, you know, using scare quotes um, around like news organization when he's talking about press progress. He's like, well, the far right has the rebel and the far left has press progress. And it's like, well, one of them seems to keep hiring neo-Nazis for some reason. Um, and, um, um, you know, and, uh, you know, it manufactures stories and creates conflict and uses it to fundraise and sues anyone who says anything bad about them. I hope I don't land you in court. Hey, saying hey, that. I will say this as an editorial free speech, the podcast where we interviews uh, online show where we talk to anyone and everyone. If you want to sue us, send us the letter we will ensure i, I would <laughs> my dream is to get sued for calling someone litigious like <laughs> <Okay>. that <laughs> i so I, and this is where i want to get to because i think you've opened but it's up also a, undeniable that uh you know faith goldie and gavin mckinnis and uh tommy robinson have and and and, and uh that little shit who uh, sold Nazi memorabilia, um, whose name I've already forgotten, Keen Bexty, uh, right? I mean, have worked, have been paid money by the rebels. So, I mean, facts are facts. Um, whereas uh, Press Progress, of course, does not do that. And when they- They're just accused these... of being communist and all that by yeah. everyone else. It's, it's a weird situation that we live in. Well, yeah. And... Anyway. <laughs> um, but but um, uh, you, yeah, you... so- Go ahead. go ahead. I was going to say, no. you open up a good question because this is where we're going to turn the subject from you into the journalism as a whole now. Journalism of today, of 2022, is not the same as journalism of 1990s or even early 2000. Uh, and this, it, it, it's not well, the same as journalism in 2015. No, and, and I agree with that. The rise of shows like this, of like the uh, Forgotten Corner, the Big Shiny Takes, the Counter Signal with Keenan Brackett, or however you want to pronounce his name, his uh, has has changed the name of how news gets out there. Everyone can put a slant on their own news. How do you, as an independent journalist, break through that barrier and try to say, okay? What I'm doing is news. What they're doing is opinion covered in news. Because I think that's where a lot of people are confused these days is they don't know what actually is news because everyone just assumes that they're a news organization, which I know I'm not. I'm, I'm, I will be the first to admit we do independent journalism. We do some stuff, but most of it is conversations like this. And it's an actual conversation. And I, I ask the questions as the quote unquote host. And I, 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 I've been... 
I've been referred to as Michael Moore, Charlie Rose, and Matt Lauer all in the same month. And I don't know if I should take that as a slight or a complete like honor, but there you go. So how do you break through the the, the sort of the well, I wouldn't mass. compare you. I wouldn't compare you to Charlie Rose because you have clothes on, <laughs> and Matt Lauer. <laughs> yeah, Matt. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know. I'm not in your office. I don't know if you have like there, a there you go. door locking button underneath. But uh, hey, I like Michael Moore. I mean, his last movie was uh, I, I didn't see it, so I, you know it's tough to comment. But uh, the reviews from people I trust were uh, quite devastating. But um, you know, he's he's made some great movies and. Uh, I mean, is there a factual inaccuracy and sensationalism here and there? Of course, but he's a filmmaker, right? I mean, um, and I, I, I but um, so the line between news and opinion, I think is a lot finer than people give credit because as, you know, as I, I, I think I got ahead of myself, first question you asked me, I, you know, I, 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 I sort of talked about, you know, sort of being open about where I stand on issues and then within that framework sort of laying out the facts and arranging them accordingly and providing my own commentary based on the facts right and um you know in you, you see I mean in 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 the the Canadian media is overwhelmingly right wing and the media in Calgary is even more overwhelmingly right wing. And I mean, you have a lot of great reporters working at the Calgary Herald and uh, the Edmonton Journal as well, who do great work and they're not allowed to even uh, come close to, uh, you know, expressing their opinion in, in, in copy or online or whatnot. Obviously people fall through the crap, you know, things fall through the crack sometimes and, but, um, and then meanwhile, the columnists at their newspaper can say whatever the fuck they want without any um, uh, oversight um, and often uh, damage the credibility of the great reporting those newspapers do. And I, you know, um, and do you, there's, do you, there's do you, no do you think that. The columnists that I've seen, like the Rick Bells, and don't get me wrong, Rick Bell uh, probably is a nice guy. I've never met him in my life, so I can't say yes or no to this. But well, he doesn't like me because I've been mean to him on Twitter. <laughs> but I actually, you know what, Rick Bell, like he's he's written some disgusting things about people who use drugs, and uh, you know I don't. Um, but do you think people look at him as the sort of the journalist? Do people look at well, columnists you know today as journalists? I mean, he is a guilty player. I enjoy reading Rick Bell. I do. I confess. Um, I, I like he is he's the perfect sun writer. Just really like punchy and very like simple. Um, but um, you know, very readable. Um, now, in terms of is he a journalist? Um, I mean, I would say so. I, whether he's a good journalist or not is a, a different question. But I mean, he goes to press conferences, he asks questions, and sometimes he, he'll ask questions that I want to know the answer to for the opposite reason, right? Like I remember when they were talking about the budget in late 2021, and he asked the mayor, will you commit to keeping a tax increase to what administration was asking for, which was very minuscule. Like 1% or something, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and basically she said, no, no, like we'll see what we need and then we'll raise, we'll adjust taxes accordingly. And I, you know, that's what I wanted to hear from the opposite perspective, um, you know, but, um, you know, the question of what is journalism is also, uh, you know, it's a tricky one because is Ezra Levant a journalist? I wouldn't say so. Um, but but then where do you draw the line between someone like him or someone like Leisha Corbella or David Staples, right? And, it, it, you know, it, it's in a sense, it's a it's a fool's errand to, to sort of uh, make these distinctions, right? Because um, at the end of the day, <laughs> we're all uh, to the content mill, right? And, uh, you know, at a newspaper, um, even if you're doing great work, you're, at the end of the day, you're filling in space uh, between ads. 
Do you, do you think that journalism is going the way that you've gone? The sort of freelance sub, uh, sub track, uh, sub stack, sorry. Okay, <laughs> I will get it right by the end sub stack. Of, <laughs> a sub stack. I will get it right by the end of this interview. Yeah. But my life depends on it. Do you think more journalists, more, uh, more content is going to be produced that way and more media is going to be moving to the subscription, subscription of, hey, if you like this journalist, subscribe to this person. Because I, I see a big movement, a big shift, because we saw recently with the, the sort of former CBC employee who said, I'm moving to Substack because CBC is too woke for me and it's a propaganda machine. Do you think more journalists are going to be doing that because now they're free to write what they want? Well, I think we have to distinguish between uh, people like Tara Henley and Barry Weiss and uh, Glenn Greenwald, who I remember, I'm old enough to remember when he was actually a journalist. Now he's a Fox News like talking head, but uh, sort of manufacturing these, these, uh, these disputes with their employer and just saying, I'm quitting in the name of free speech, please give me money because I, I, you know, I'm taking this huge risk. And people like myself and others, much smaller substacks, um, um, that or do it out of necessity that you know there are no jobs right while these uh, media elites these people who are allowed to write whatever they wanted at their former news outlets i mean henley's a bit different but i'm talking about like matt taibbi and barry weiss um you know i i, I think there's then there are people like myself who are doing it because there are no jobs and i think is that the future of journalism i mean I think this, this, you know, because it is essentially gig work, right? Like you're doing this work and you get paid based on how many subscribers you attract, not like a day's work, you know, or a certain amount of output. And I, you know, I, I think there's a risk that that's just the future of the economy, right? Yeah. That everyone that there are no more jobs and everyone's just driving for uber and or uh writing for substack right and you're not an employee with them you don't have there, that human element is eliminated you don't have a newsroom you go to and you can socialize with people and bounce ideas off them and get into heated exchanges sometimes um and, um, you know obviously I mean they're you know being your own boss as the mantra is 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 good I, I i like um that element but you know you lose a lot um along the way now you know i also freelance for various outlets i'm i have a couple of pieces for the sprawl um sort of in the works that i haven't started working on them yet but i you know they're ideas that uh jeremy and i have uh sort of bounced between each other and so um that's another aspect uh having not having one boss but having a bunch of bosses um but um is it, i mean it's also promising because there is this progressive media space in canada that didn't exist when i moved out to alberta like when when i moved out to alberta the goal was like to one day move back to toronto and be a columnist for the star which would still be cool like you star. know <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, they, um, there's Just a, a <laughs> really fun fact, really stupid fun fact, but the home, my hometown is the hometown of Joseph Atkinson. So that's why I like the star because, oh, is I, that right? I literally came from the same town that the Toronto star literally started it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, they're one of the few mainstream news publications that actually have a few columnists who are um are are left wing right like Sri Pardikar and Tom Wacom and uh Rick Salutin um though he's definitely getting up there in age um so and go ahead, um finish off but, and we'll move on to the next segment here but yeah but now I mean there are you know all these outlets like Passage and the Maple and the Harbinger Media Network which both my podcasts are on and uh you know I I mean um you know, it's exciting that there is this uh progressive uh media sphere that um obviously doesn't have the resources to take on post media 
or you know the the news networks and whatnot but i mean it's growing and um it seems that there are a lot of people who um don't see their their perspectives reflected in the mainstream media and uh this is sort of giving them a place to um you know consume news that um that um reflects um who they are right um while you know mainstream media are also shedding jobs to um you know uh be able to pay out dividends to shareholders who often don't even live in canada um it is cool to see a sort of uh progressive alternative developed to that which certainly didn't exist um when i was growing up and uh yeah his his only really um you know come into its own in in, in the past couple of years I want to turn to one last subject area, and then we're going to wrap up here, Jeremy. And that is, uh, we've talked about your career. We've talked about the state of media, but let's talk about some of the things that are going on in Alberta today. Uh, and because you, you're a very vocal person on social media, so I'm pretty sure you're not well. You're you're willing to chat about it. Um, so recently, in the last few weeks, uh, because this is coming out uh, January 31st. Uh, Justice Minister, or sorry, former in, interim, or however you want to call him, Justice Minister of Alberta, Casey Madu, uh, was sort of discovered that he was distracted driving in a school zone area in Edmonton. He has now taken a step back because Jason Kenney has asked him to, or he asked Jason Kenney to take a step back. Where does this story go, in your opinion? Does Casey Madu leave... Uh, office does he leave and go back to the back bench and just stays there in oblivion for the rest of his life what's your opinion on Casey Maddo and the distractive driving story that has surrounded him in the last few weeks few days well that is the, the, first of all I just want to say that's a good example of like a mainstream news outlet and I've got a lot I mean how much time you got I can tell you all <laughs> sorts of things I don't like about CBC yeah um uh but, but, one of the only good Twitter accounts is uh, CBC Pitchbot, by the way, uh, in my opinion, um, which just roasts the uh, national broadcaster. Um, so you're not a fan of CBC? Well, <laughs> no, I, I, I like the news. I like good stories. And um, every news outlet you know the herald um you know even the national post sometimes though uh decreasingly so um have good stories they get good scoops and um you know you love to see it it's um um i mean those news guard uh ratings i mentioned before like the calgary herald toronto sound national post i think they received like they got like 93.5 or something or 92.5 out of 100 wow. you know that seven and a half percent is solely based on their columnists, right? And, but um, yeah, I mean, I have problems with CBC's, uh, how the CBC is, is So what managed. was your issue with this story then? Oh, there's no, no, sorry. So I'm saying that this is an example of a mainstream news outlet getting the goods. Like, oh, this okay. is great journalism. Um, you know, also, you know, at the Herald, which I also lots of criticisms of, I mean, Madeline Smith and Megan Potkins uh, work on the breaking open the Maglioka scandal was, uh, you know, great work. Um, and um, the but um, so with, with with this made did, did you read Don Braid's column um, today? Not today. I haven't read it today. I mean, uh, there's been that's. I mean, Don Braid's also one of those who. I mean, I don't agree with him. I think he he gets taken for a ride sometimes by you know people in power. There's always a risk in, in journalism when you have all these connections that you want to hold on to. But um, it was it, it's sort of a bombshell. I mean, he 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 writes that. Um, oh, that is this the? They Rick knew McIver. like 10 months ago. Yeah. 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 That so right. And I like, I don't know if we do we need to tell your your viewers like what the story is, or do we assume they already know? 
I, I want to say that I want to assume they already know, but let's give a brief background if you want. Yeah. Okay. So in March, uh, now former or... Um, and that's the thing. He's not officially yeah. stepped down. He's just released his duties. Yeah. I think Kenny said step back. He's, yeah. He's stepping back. So that suggests pending the outcome of some independent investigation, be interesting to see the details of how imp- independent that investigation actually is. But he got distracted driving ticket for being on his phone in a playground area in Edmonton, um, where he is the sole conservative MLA, won his election by about 800 votes in uh, uh, 2019. Um, But yeah, he so he got this distracted driving ticket. And, you know, as we all do, when when we get a ticket for shitty driving, we call up the police chief. And, and to talk about it. Now, both he and the police chief say he didn't ask for the ticket to be withdrawn. But you don't have to ask in order to ask. You yeah. know what I mean? And so he brought up uh, racial profiling of uh, you know Black Canadians, which is, of course, a very real issue that we ought to take very seriously, though to me it seems like very cynical weaponization of identity politics, but I'll, you know I'm you know I'm not an expert on these things. Um, he brought up the fact that Shannon Phillips, the MLA yeah, for, yeah, he, he West, brought up that Shannon Phillips was being surveilled by the Leftbridge Police Service and was asking if he was being surveilled. And according to Maydu, the police chief told him, no, you're not being surveilled. And he was like, okay. Um, and I mean, what it sounds like to me is he was testing the waters to see if he could get out of it. And McPhee was just like, no, sorry. And um, so he gets and, it on the so, Monday or Tuesday, if I'm not mistaken, the speeding yeah. ticket. He pays for it, according to CBC's uh, reporting, that Friday. So literally, he pays it that the end by the end of the week. That week, he pays for, if I'm not mistaken, he pays for the ticket, the full ticket outright. So this story is nothing. So this is 2021, March of 2020, March of 2021 or 2022, 2020 or 2020. Well, 2021 because 2021. March 2022 hasn't happened. Yeah, sorry. So about two weeks ago, as of this airing, middle of January. Uh, CBC releases, I think it's about three o'clock in the afternoon that this ticket happened and they had called. He had uh, Casey Madu, the F- MLA for Edmonton Southwest, the Minister of Justice, had called the police chief. Social media sparks off a massive firestorm of who knew when, who didn't know when, and how how could this happen a minister of justice calling a police chief to potentially get a ticket overturned but both parties say that that didn't happen the next morning jason kenny comes out and said he has asked casey madu minister of justice to step back pending an uh, uh, independent investigation Brings in Sonia Savage to serve as the interim justice minister. Now, Sonia Savage made international headlines during the early days of the pandemic for saying that now is a great time to build pipelines because no one can protest them, which was, of course, before the uh, killing of George Floyd and the mass demonstrations against um, police brutality all over the world um, and also uh, an increasing which coincided with an increasing awareness that COVID doesn't spread much outdoors. Um, but um, th- so a very, uh, you know, that sends a message appointing her to the justice ministry. But uh, so Maydu um, has now stepped aside. Kenny was like, I had no idea. I found out about this through the media. But uh, Don Braid uh, reported today in a column that, Uh, Rick McIver, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and former Calgary City Councillor, knew. Uh, Matt Wolf, who I wanted to forget exists, but (laughs) unfortunately I can't now, uh, knew that um, uh, another minister knew. 
I want I want to say Doug Schweitzer, but it's not. No, it wasn't Schweitzer. It was hold on. Let me pull up the column. Uh, uh, Jason Nixon. Nixon. There you go. Jason Nixon knew. Government House Leader. <laughs> yeah, and uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, two top Kenny's deputy chief of staff at the time and chief of staff, Pat Livingston and Larry uh, Kalmeyer knew. Now, uh, Braid couldn't confirm whether Kenny himself knew, but I mean, if his top two advisors knew, I mean, if they're not telling their boss about this, they're not doing their jobs. Um, and I'm not uh, advocating snitching, but I'm just saying that, you know, in politics, if your top advisors know something, yeah, you either know or you damn well should know. <laughs> and if you don't know, then I think there needs to be a long conversation with those two deputy chief of staffs to say, why didn't I know? And what else are you hiding from me? Because that would be the bigger story of what else have does Jason Kenny not know about what's happening in the uh, used to be caucus? And that, yeah. and I would say the exact same thing for Rachel Notley because don't get me wrong, uh, anyone who's listened to the show before knows I I am not a big fan of the NDP, be, uh, the Alberta NDP, because there are some issues in that party that they seem to have glossed over since they their time in opposition, and we can talk about that in a few minutes if you want. But I I I want people to know that. We, yeah, hmm. no comment. Yeah. Um, so obviously. So uh, does Casey Madu basically have to step back or because he's the only Edmonton MLA, UCP MLA, he kind of is stuck in a, or does he get shuffled out of justice well, into some low lying portfolio? <laughs> well, I think it's safe to say he's not going to be in cabinet. Um before the next election. I mean, I could be wrong, but it just doesn't seem likely to me. Um, I, uh, yeah, I think he's going to, um, well, I mean, there's what I think he's going to do and what I think he should do. And uh, what he's going to do, I think, is stick around. And I mean, considering the fact that he won by just 800 votes in Edmonton, in an election where the UCP took more than half of the vote province-wide, now that the UCP is so unpopular and the NDP is doing rather well on the polls, I think he's toast. And I think he should step down to avoid uh, being humiliated uh, further. I mean, um, if you recall when he was municipal affairs minister, I mean, talk to anyone in the city of Calgary who were, you know, any Calgary city councilor except for maybe a few, and they, could, they couldn't work with him, right? I mean, the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association uh, denounced him, which is something they never do, um, because obviously their job is to have a constructive working relationship with government, but he just ran through these electoral changes, and the AUMA had its criticisms of them, and he just totally ignored them. So, um, that's two humiliations and two cabinet ministries. Uh, he represents a riding in Edmonton, which is obviously an NDP stronghold, at least provincially. Um, and so um, I think, again, I think he should resign and let uh, another UCP person lose that riding. But um, oh, out on top, I'm undefeated. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But that's also easy for me to say. Obviously, when you're in this position, there are other facts, right? There are these pressures to keep it going and try and turn things around. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I thought the UCP was for sure going to serve at least two terms when they won. And even like until COVID, really. Um, but I mean, now I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I, this is where I, you I, and I will disagree on. Completely. Well, I don't. I, know, I, I mean, I don't underestimate the NDP's ability to screw it up and lose. I that is a distinct possibility. But I, in, I think what we saw in the states, though, with uh, people who are just fed up with Trump and Joe Biden wasn't an inspirational candidate by any means, but. Uh, people are against Trump, rallied behind him, and they uh, pushed him over the edge. I, I think that could happen with Rachel Notley again. Um, again, you know, predictions are 
such a crapshoot in politics. Um, but um, I, yeah, I, I mean, I could definitely see Rachel Notley becoming premier again. So, and, uh, you know, further alienating uh, the NDP's progressive base by, uh, you know, just trying to get um, all of the conservatives who don't like the UCP to vote for the NDP. And, and whether that's a successful electoral strategy or not, um, I think that's clearly the direction uh, she is moving in. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15-second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. I think you, you you've hit the ha hammer right on the nail there because I, I spoke to someone back in November, right before my surgery. I forget, uh, former NDP candidate for Lakeland, the federal riding of Lakeland. And she said that there's a lot of progressives who are getting pissed off at the Alberta NDP because they have been quiet on social issues and very progressive issues, mainly the Wet'suwet'en and First Nation pipeline. The one that's going, the pipeline that's going through the Wet'suwet'en First Nation in BC, uh, how the RCMP have gone in and taken uh, First Nation chiefs, but also journalists out and forcibly removed them from there. And the Alberta NDP are silent on this issue. So I think there's a lot of progressives who are going to leave and not look and potentially look for another party. And if the Alberta NDP want to win, they need a coalition. They can't just rely on those conservative voters who are pissed off at Jason Kenney. They need both. And that's what happened in 2015, how they won. They had both of those. So if they want to win again, they need both. And right now, it doesn't look like they're trying to court those people who are getting pissed off at the progressive side of the NDP. There's my two cents on that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Uh, you know, I, also, I mean, I wasn't here for 2015, right? So I'm still, even though I've lived in Alberta f almost five years, which is crazy to me, um, I still don't have that maybe intuitive sense of uh, the uh, the uh, winds of Alberta politics that people have lived here longer. How, how long have you lived here, Chris? 2013, Lloydminster, Saskatchewan, Alberta. I moved there from Orno, Ontario. <laughs> oh, okay. So you've been here almost twice as long as me. So, and I, I, I don't mind it. I, I thought I, I was like yourself. I came here thinking I'll be here for a few years and go back to Ontario and find this amazing job. But life took me to Lloydminster, Saskatchewan, Alberta, then up to Slave Lake, Alberta, then Faust, Alberta, and then Calgary, Alberta. And here we are, married and loving life. <laughs> Woo. Um, my last question for you here, Jeremy, is this. We are coming up to 100 days of this new council term. You covered politics. You covered uh, City Hall prior to this new administration being sworn in on October 21st. So I, I've got to ask the question, is this new council more friendly to media than the previous one? Because at the end of the last administration, there was a lot of concern that the top candidate, whether it be Nenshi and Farkas, were taking a lot of the media spotlight and they were doing a lot of the interviews, Farkas because he was probably running for mayor, but Nenshi because he was, he's Nenshi and everyone talks. Well, Farkas about is just one of those guys who's like addicted to being on camera. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we haven't heard anything from him since. I like, I, you know, I half joked on election night he's going to be back at the manning center tomorrow and uh i don't know someone should check in on him. I, I think well last time i saw the post from him on social media he was gonna do the some trek down in the states that uh reese witherspoon did in the movie wild like go backpacking so that's back actually cool maybe he's like gonna do ayahuasca in there. like <laughs> nature and just become like a socialist <laughs> there you go um so in your opinion do you believe that this council is more media friendly and more accessible than potentially previous administrations that's a good question um 
again, I, I only covered the tail end of the yeah. last council. I know Nenshi was great with media, very accessible, very, also very media savvy, right? Like he, he, he knows what he's doing and, you know, an all around likable guy. And, you know, I have some critiques of some policies of his that we don't have time to get into, but um, okay, we'll have you back for another episode. <laughs> oh, I, I would love that anytime. But um, I, I, I think Jody is, has, um, in, in that respect and many others sort of carried the Nenshi torch um, that from my experience, she's quite accessible. A as far as other counselors go, um, uh, they're still green. I, know, I understand that because it's yeah. only been a hundred days, but uh, don't get me wrong. I'm going to do a shameless plug here because it's coming up here on February 3rd. Uh, we have uh, two interviews lined up with city councillors who we're going to do live interviews with them so i'm looking forward to that so i think they're a little bit more accessible i i tried right prior to this whole show going sort of ape wild during the election with those debates and all the candidate forms um they seem to be more engaged previous council to me they were like who are you we don't want to talk to you maybe because we were an online podcast I right. quoted that they might not have, but to me, they seem like, and I just wanted to know if it was just me or if it's. Well, you're, you're talking to Penner and me. Yes. Right? And, and we're, from, in, we're, we're in conversation with three others right now. Yeah. And I mean, again, I can't really compare it to the last council, but I, you know, with the exception of, uh, of Sean Chu, of course, um, uh, for, you know, reasons that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, it seems to me like, um, you, you know, you, you go to council and, uh, you know, Andre Chabot, who I think is um, my counselor. Oh, is that right? You're in word 10. Uh, so you didn't have a counselor for a while uh, yep. last year. but Well, I did. I had George Jahal. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. They sort of divvied up the word yep. between uh, two. Um, who, well, anyways, I think Andre Trevor is batshit insane, uh, but um, he's been quite accessible. I know when they were talking about fluoridation, he came out to talk to media. I asked him a very uh, provocative question that he sort of smirked and answered uh, to the best of his ability um, about the fact, because he was saying that fluoridation, there, there's just not enough of a consensus, even though a clear majority voted for it. And it was, I, I looked at um the, the, the voting distribution in his ward. And the yes side in fluoridation got more votes than he did. So I asked him about that and, uh, you know, he did his best to answer it. Um, and, you know, Dan McLean has been very accessible to the media. He sort of, I mean, I, I wrote a Substack piece recently that he is sort of the farkus of this council. Uh, not that I think he's running for mayor, Maybe he is, but um, just in that he's always out there uh, getting his position across. He's sort of the, uh, you know, the libertarian contrarian of council. The one um, I've been shocked about, Sonia Sharp. In, in terms of her voting record? or Yeah. Accepts, yeah. Well, she's, she's I, like, I, how did I Calgary's future wind up endorsing her? Because she's That's... very conservative. I was, I was talking to Jacob McGregor about that, too. And he's like, I, you know, obviously, we're on opposite ends of the political spectrum. But he was like, I've been very impressed by her. And I was like, yeah, I've been very, dis not just, <laughs> I didn't really have expectations for her, but I didn't expect her to be as consistently conservative as she has been. Um, but I mean, it make, right, it's word Sutherland's old word. So, I mean, it makes sense, right? And I think, so Calgary's Future, I think, endorsed her, whereas... Um, I think um, Calgary's Future and Progress... Uh, or Calgary Forward. No, yeah. one of them didn't make an endorsement for Word 1. Okay. I... Uh, now you're gonna now you got me thinking that I'm like I, I know one of them did endorse her because I was like okay I'm just gonna do this right now this is the point of time where I'm gonna cut in and do a little bit of a commercial break so that way I can make sure I get this correct here uh, did they delete all the information probably oh final election endorsements no nope. sorry Take no it's uh, this latest. I 
they they've scrubbed their website. <laughs> oh, they Mysteri- no, I, I'm not. I don't think there's conspiracy there. I just think it's old news. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously, in the last council, Maglioka was very tight lipped for uh, you know any reasons. reasons. Again, you're, you'll be familiar with. I, I guess Sean Chu is playing that role now. Um, you know, Courtney Walcott, who's my um, counselor, um, has been uh, very accessible, very out there, willing to speak with the media. Um, uh, you know, Penner, has, I have been very impressed by her for the most part. Um, and, uh, you know, Wine. Mian is... Go ahead. Uh, Wineness is a bit of a wild card, eh? Yeah, I, I, I've i tried to reach out to her office a few times and I haven't heard anything back. So that's why I'm just like, okay, just move move on and hope for the best. See, the thing is, I haven't reached out to many of their offices because either I'll go to council to cover something and then just speak to whoever's speaking to reporters after. And it's usually a different counselor depending on who's talking about what in council. Um, or I'll just uh you know uh aggregate what the calgary herald or global news or ctv or cbc have uh covered and just use the quotes that were from whatever counselor they spoke to i hate a journalist i hate a journalist like that it would just wait just put their microphone up and just go okay everyone else has a question i have nothing so that i'll just use that audio well but i mean it's good to do that sometimes if you're not like well informed on what they're talking about to just learn oh and but 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 my thing was all the like the when i was in lloyd minster this is where it really got me when i was in lloyd minster the tv reporters who i know some of the tv port reporters who are currently here on tv stations here in calgary would just sit there with their microphone and just not even look at the uh person and just let the film record and then Whose, whose question is on the 6.30 news that night? Oh, it's mine. Shocker. So anyway, there's my there's my rant about journalism in 2022. Stop doing that. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, and but that's also a symptom of like the, the growth of newsletters, right? Like, the, you know, rewriting someone else's story, uh, you know, you're giving them credit, but you're also sort of getting clicks to where you want them to be, right? And oh, it's oh I do that ideal. all the time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, time. it's it, you know, I prefer obviously to go out and do original reporting, but sometimes when you're really pressed for time, it's like, all right, well, what's what's the Herald reporting today? And it's like, oh, that's interesting. Maybe I'll check the CBC, draw some, right, and like put it together and create something of your own, right? Yeah. It's like almost it's like being a DJ right instead of like a live musician no right I, you're just taking samples and putting them together into something um that is unique and i, I get that and I, I should say that i do i do appreciate journalism in today's society because i think there is a need for it still because i think that we are getting into a world where there's so much disinformation out there that we need people holding people to account and actually telling the story. I just hope that it doesn't get lost. And we we don't have some journalists who, and I'm not saying all, I should not paint a broad stroke here, but there are some journalists who I find lazy. And yet again, oh, I'm, not sure. a, I'm not a journalist. I, 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 I'm just a host of a show and that's all. <laughs> yeah. But I try and, you know, I, I think it is, uh, and I think this may be contradicting what I said earlier, but I think it is important to distinguish between uh, reporters and columnists. Yeah. Um, at least at mainstream news outlets where that line is, yeah. is, is, is clearer than it is in alternative media. Um, and but and, and and you know and I try and give reporters the benefit of the doubt and just blame their their bosses when when they produce um, uh, things that I, I I don't think are useful um, right because I I working in a, da- a daily newspaper like I, I I would write tons of things that I just thought was oh so you're just like a a mill right you just have to yeah keep on just like rewriting content. press releases and shit and you just have no time to actually look give the stories the in-depth coverage that's warranted mm-hmm. um and you know I, even right i mean that's the editor's job is to figure out how to 
and I don't mean just the copy editor, right? I'm not talking about like grammatical errors or whatever. I mean like the managing error, right? The the top editorial staff yeah. are supposed to set the agenda. And uh, yeah, I mean, often uh, seems like they're asleep at the wheel to be charitable um, at, you know, various news outlets. And I don't want to paint anyone with a broad brush. No. Um, Jeremy, I want to thank you for doing this. This has been an enlightening conversation. Um, oh, I, I had a great time. Uh, I, I like. When I, I'm say really. That. I'm yeah, not sure I'm if really they're sincere good. when they say that, though, because I'm like, are you bullshitting me right now? Just because we're recording or what? Yeah, no, and I, I, you know, I, I really appreciated uh, the work you did throughout the election campaign. Um, Thanks for you know, covering I, it. It was the first time I've ever been live tweeted in my life before. <laughs> well, so well that's the thing with the sprawl too. And what I try to do like with newsletter is look at what like the mainstream outlets do. And, a, you know, a lot of what their reporters do is good and look for gaps in sort of that coverage in sort of when it came to debates, it was like, what debates are in? getting that much attention and I came across yours because, um, you know, people are so fixated on the mayoral debates and fair enough. But, uh, you know, the, 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 the local debates were very interesting, too. And I'm really, I'm really glad that you did those. And I also had no idea you were sick until I read about in CBC, which I think uh, is a testament to your abilities as a broadcaster. Um, as, a, as a host. I'm not a broadcaster. I'm a host. And that's You're a broadcaster. We're broadcasting right now. That's true. That's true. Five days a week. It, it, it takes a lot out of you to do this five days do, a week. Do you record five days a week? We, we well we re, well we record about twelve episodes in like four days and then oh and then you the, divvy them up yes oh, I didn't know that yes part. we are very much in the opinion that every day there's a new day so let's put out a new episode each day and people seem to like we we don't get the traction as we did it during the municipal election for our YouTube videos but our like our show people listen to it and like i'm not sure if you look at the algorithms on uh your podcast but i look at mine all the time and like oh, oh yeah I, why I the hell are people from haiti listening to my show like i'm like well, vpns is, is it it's gotta be okay. i mean i don't know maybe you there's a like calgary expat community in haiti that um you, yeah. you, i mean you never know right but I, I just assume the more obscure locations where it's like, I don't know anyone who lives here. It, I'd be like, okay, either it's Canadian expat community yeah. or VPN. That's and true. I think usually it's the latter. Right? Probably. Now you've got me a second guess of myself on if it were a worldwide show. Ha! Um, I mean, that's sort of the fun of it. You don't know. Exactly. Just be grateful for, uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm grateful for whatever, um, you know, listeners I get whether they're giving oh. their actual location or not. I am too. Don't get me wrong. Like the, Yeah, like, no, I, I, I didn't mean to like, no, I wasn't calling I, you an ingrate. That's why I sort of corrected myself. I, I just, I, I like love that. seeing our show numbers grow and it seems like people like content that we're producing and people enjoy it. People enjoy coming on the show. Like we've had some great guests on the show so far. So we're looking forward to the future. No, it's actually very similar to what we're doing at the Forgotten Corner, um, yeah. which uh, we sh you should come on one of these days. Anytime, if you're willing to have me, I'm willing to jump on and talk about whatever you want. Um, how can people find you? Uh, social media and all that jazz. Well, I am on Twitter at Jeremy Appel 1025. 1025 10 is my, it's my birthday. Okay. So if anyone wants to wish me a happy birthday, um, October 25th is my birthday and it's in my Twitter handle. Um, I, you can also listen to both my podcasts on uh, whatever um, app you use to listen to podcasts. They're Everywhere. on all of them. <laughs> Uh, I would also recommend uh, if you like um, those shows and you're looking for more in that vein, um, to uh, check out the Harbinger Media Network. There are a lot of really great podcasts on that network. I, I, you know, I do feel like I'm standing on the shoulder of giants. Um, and uh, my substack, which is Appel Orchard, that's A-P-P-E-L, orchard.substack.com. Um, and then you can also uh, find my writing elsewhere, but follow me on Twitter. You, you know, you'll find it. I'm not going to 
making an entire list of all the outlets I write for. Uh, for those who have, like I said at the beginning at the top of the show, uh, <laughs> if you want to follow Jeremy, the show notes, click below. The Twitter handle will be there. All the links to his uh, podcast will be there and his sub stack will be there as well. You did uh, it. Yes, finally. You promise made, <laughs> promise kept. There you go. Open for summer now. There we go. <laughs> um, Jeremy, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure for everyone listening. Please remember, if you haven't already, hit go over to our website, crossboardinterviews.ca. Hit these, uh, the uh, upcoming events page where you can get tickets to our live recordings with Councillor Courtney Penner on February 3rd, Councillor Jasmine Meehan on February 10th, and there's going to be some future ones. Uh, I can't release them right now because we're still in negotiations as of recording this, but you'll see them in the future dates. Uh, for everyone here at the Cross Board Interviews with Chris Brown, have yourself an excellent rest of your day. And remember, guys, just keep talking.